Well, I want to welcome you to our Bible study for today. Thank you so much for joining me tonight in our season of Epiphany. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of your word and open up our hearts to what you would speak to us today, that we might be touched and transformed. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as we mentioned, is the continuing celebration of the season after the Epiphany, the revelation of the nature, the character of Christ, and all of the lessons that we read, we are meant to have a revelation or an aha moment of sorts that reveals to us who Jesus Christ is and how it is supposed to transform our lives. Now, in our lectionaries for Sundays, we read from an Old Testament lesson, from a psalm, from an epistle. We've been looking at 1 Corinthians over this last month or so, and then, of course, a gospel lesson. And so uh, this lesson is appointed for this last week, but it's odd if you were an astute observer, you're thinking, wait a minute, didn't we just look at 1 Corinthians 13 last week? So we just looked at chapter 13. What happened to chapter 14? Huh. Well, it's a victim of the lectionary. It doesn't get read in our worship service. It's an interesting chapter. And I'm kind of disappointed by that. But basically, if you remember 1 Corinthians 13, what we learned is that it is kind of, it's a love passage, but it's not about romantic love or love uh, between a man and a woman. It's a, love, it's, it's, it's a command of love, that this is the most important thing because the church in Corinth was ready to destroy each other. They had multiple groups that were fighting for preeminence and, and for power. And uh, Paul was saying, this is not the way of Christ. There is a better way, and that way is love. So there you go. Hopefully that destroys this passage for you for a wedding passage, because that's not really what it is. It's okay if you read it at weddings, but please understand, it isn't about romantic love. All right, so this church is ready to tear each other apart. And then Paul goes into chapter 14. He starts talking about speaking in tongues and about prophecies. Okay, see, these represented certain groups who emphasized certain spiritual gifts as though they were better than others. If you, you know, you, only the people that we should respect are the people who speak in tongues or prophesy in some way. These are the most important spiritual gifts. Remember, Paul's already debunked that. Bunk, he says. These things are all going to pass away someday. They're not all that important. The most important thing is love. And who cares about these things? He says, it's okay to speak in tongues because it's given by God. It's okay to speak in prophecies as long as it's given by God. But don't think you're a bag of chips and all that just because you've got the ability to do that. Good for you. But this one is so much more important than any of this. So don't hold these things up. So it's kind of a continuation of that. And he talks about orderly worship because what was happening is people who prophesied or spoke in tongues, were always interrupting the worship service to show how <clears throat> important they were, okay? It was an interruption to the service. God's word was being neglected because these egomaniacs wanted to impose themselves upon the order of the church. Paul says, this is not the way of Christ. It is not the way of Christ. Maybe you've been to a church where you speak in tongues, and I've got no problems with that. That's fine. We've had folks here who have, but are sitting here interrupting the flow of the service and the order of the service and the pastor's in the middle of the sermon or you're in the middle of a very quiet time and they start shouting things out. They're not being obedient to following the Holy Spirit. Okay? They're imposing their will upon the gathering of the community of Christ to show off, I guess, to strut their stuff. You know, and uh, Paul is saying, this is just not the way of Christ. And he ends the chapter by saying, you need to listen to what I'm telling you because it's as though it's, it's this command of God. You want, need to understand this is, this is directly coming from God. Now, this leaves people with a big question mark. So Paul claims to be speaking for God. He's speaking for God? Who's he to tell us what to do and what to think and how to believe and how to operate our church? 
And so Paul basically argues for where his authority comes from. He wants to make sure that people understand it isn't from him, himself. His authority is something that stands outside of himself. And so this is what we're looking at in chapter 15 for today. So hopefully you see kind of the flow of how these chapters work together. I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 14 as a part of your devotions this week, and then maybe reread what we're doing here for tonight, and maybe it'll make a little more sense. So I would remind you, brothers, Paul says, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, and which you also stand through which you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you've come to believe in vain. So first thing Paul says is, remember, I'm the one that proclaimed Christ to you. I proclaim Christ. I'm going to put the symbol for Christ. That's the Paschal Cross. So I proclaim Christ to you. You've come to believe because of the message that I proclaim to you. So you should listen to what I'm saying. So he's, again, arguing, if you came to Christ because of what I preach, then probably what I'm speaking now is correct. Okay? So then he goes on. For I hand it to you as of first importance what I in turn received from Christ. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Um, I just want to, this is really important, okay? Paul is concerned that the church at Corinth is consumed with very unimportant things. Speaking in tongues. Who's got the authority and power? Okay? Whether it's the Jews or the Greeks, the rich or the poor. They're a conflicted church. And Paul is saying, you have forgotten the most important thing. And I would contend to you that we, the Church of Christ, have forgotten the most, the important thing. There's only one, and it's all about Jesus Christ. So you see, I've seen churches that get divided over, oh, I don't know, money and how they spend money. I've seen churches divided over, hmm, baptism. Do you baptize infants? Are you baptizing adults? You don't do believers' baptisms? You can't be a Christian. Or churches that get divided over who they are electing for president. We are in a very divisive time in our country, and you've got the, uh, <laughs> you, basically, you basically have multiple political groups trying to vie for authority, and guess what? This is being played out in our churches. We have churches that are either all liberals, all conservatives. And it, Paul has got to be looking at this just downtrodden, just saying, what are you doing, church? You've made, if your church is divided by your politics, if you look at your church and everybody in your church is pulling that lever for Democrats in the fall, or everybody in your church is pulling that lever for Republicans in the fall, and that seems to be a con constant discussion in your church, I think you're doing something wrong in your church. I'm just being frank, okay? Being real. Because then we have a divided church. We've made a decision. We've divided ourselves. Not on anything that has to do with the important thing. But on politics? Are you kidding me? I'm not saying that I'm not interested. But this isn't the important thing. Jesus is the important thing. We have lost our way in the church of Jesus Christ. We have lost our way in the United States. Not because of what conservatives or liberals say, but because we've lost our vision of Jesus and given it up to a political religion, right-wing and left-wing political religions. Am 
my opinion. But I think Paul would agree. We've lost our way. We have forgotten the important thing. We've done exactly what the church at Corinth has done. And so what did Paul say is the important thing? To remember what Jesus has done for you. Oh, okay, okay. I got a really sensitive story. Um, Christians who see somebody who's gay. And they have to unload on that person and tell them how they're going to hell unless they repent. And how they've got to change everything about it. Oh, I've, at least I told them. Woo! I won't go to hell now because I at least told them. I got it off my chest. And we have to tell them all the time. How many gay people hear the love of Jesus Christ when you do that? My guess is zero. They didn't hear the love of Jesus Christ. What they heard was hate, venom, nastiness. They heard nothing about Jesus. You have forgotten the important thing. The important thing isn't to bash them on the head and tell them how wrong they are. The important thing is to impress them with the love of Christ. Oh, by the way, just as you were impressed by the love of Christ, why do you think you're a Christian? Are you a Christian because somebody came up to you and said, you got to get your act together? That's not how you became a Christian. You became a Christian because somebody loved you. And all those things in your life that need to get changed got changed afterwards, after you found the love of Jesus Christ. So I am telling you, we have forgotten the important thing. We've forgotten to just love people. That is the only message of the church of Christ. God loves you through Jesus Christ. If we are preaching any other message than that, we are preaching a false witness, a false message. If you're fixated on trying to get people straightened out, <laughs> no pun intended, I guess there may be pun intended, then you're fixated on the wrong things. Now for those, by the way, who are watching, and I'm going to tick off some people, I'm outright telling you, I don't care whether you're gay or straight. Don't care. You're welcome at this church. We have no expectations that you're wrong and going to hell. All we want you to know is that you're loved. I've got gay family members. I've got gay friends. Don't care. I want them to know the love of Jesus Christ, just like you have the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ. Just don't care about who you're attracted to or who you're with right now. I just want you to be with Jesus. All right. Uh, yeah, like I said, I know there's some conservative Christians who be really upset about that. I've had gay council members. I've had a transgender council member. I don't care. Do you love Jesus? That's what matters. This is what Paul is trying to remind us. I know you're going back and you're thinking some are probably thinking about what are those condemnations of Paul about homosexuality? You're, you've, misread, you've misread it. <laughs> this is exactly Paul's point. You're so fixated on this stuff, you don't see that you are also indicted. If you want to drop the law on gay people, the law is going to drop on your head too. Because I will tell you, if there's no place for a gay person in the kingdom of heaven, there's no place for you either. All right. We've forgotten the important thing, people. We're fixated on legalisms. 
We're fixated on people behaving and acting the way we act. We're fixated on people having the politics that we have. We've forgotten the important thing, which is who again? Jesus Christ and his love for you. That was just demonstrated on the cross. If we are preaching any other message than that, we have missed the mark. We are driving people away. <sighs> okay. This is what Paul says. Don't believe me. Listen to Paul. So again, Paul goes through and tells them the message, the important thing, which is Christ, who died, was buried on the third day, rose again after three days. Oh, but then how would we know about this? Okay, how do we know about this? Paul goes on to verse 5. He appeared to Cephas, Peter, then the twelve. By the way, Paul is a little bit wrong here. Do you remember Jesus appeared, first of all, to Mary Magdalene? who became the very first apostle of the church. Paul seems like he was a little bit misogynistic, all right? He didn't have room uh, much for women, although it looks like later in his life he, he started transforming in his attitude towards women and so forth. If you look at Romans, where he greets Phoebe, who is the leader of the church of Rome, and I think somehow his, he's changed with that. But he, he obviously doesn't mention the women, who were the very first witnesses and apostles of the resurrection. That was very intentional, by the way, of Jesus. So Paul missed that, but we'll forgive him. So uh, he appeared to Mary and the women, doesn't say that, to Cephas and then the twelve, he does say that. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. James, why James? James, Jesus' brother. There was a lot of respect for Jesus' brother James. I know there are a lot of Christians who are very uncomfortable, in particular Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, who are really queasy when it comes to this idea that Jesus could have had biological brothers and sisters. But James apparently was a big leader within the early church and very respected. Last of all, as to one untimely born. <laughs> okay, uh, this is like an abortion. That's what that means. He's untimely born. He was aborted out of the fetus. There was no reason to expect he'd live. He, he's, he's a lesser than. He's talking about himself. For I, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, which he did. So he's trying to remind you that it isn't about him. His authority, Paul's authority, doesn't come from his character, his own nature, but from the message of Jesus Christ. So when he's calling us to love that this is the important thing, more important than prophecy, more important than speaking in tongues, He has authority because it comes from Christ. I'm the least of the apostles and fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I love that. That's uh, uh, for those of you who used to watch uh, Popeye. I am what I am. Okay. But that's what Paul says. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was within me. So whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so we have come to believe. So, again, where does Paul's authority come from to tell us that love is the most important thing in the church and that our church ought to operate out of love, not out of condemnation, not out of power, not out of authority? Paul says it ultimately doesn't come from his own authority, but from Jesus, because this is the important message. Don't forget it. So I am encouraging you. 
The next time you see somebody who's doing something, you say, oh, I can't believe somebody would do that. Rather than coming up and saying, you're going to go to hell. You need to get your act together. Maybe what we need to do is say, oh, my friend, Jesus absolutely adores you and loves you. And this is the most important message of all. Can you do that? This is what Paul is encouraging us to do. To remember the important thing. So let's take politics. Dang, man, let's get this, this crap out of our church. I'm not telling you not to be involved. But our churches shouldn't represent a particular policy. Let's get the, the, these moral codes sometimes. I don't know that we have. Um, we think that this represents Christ. You have to act or work a certain way or be a certain way. No, you don't. Why do you think Christians are so pent up sometimes and have just as many problems as everybody else? Because we put straight jackets on people. We say, you got to be this way, and if you're not... Well, there's no place for you here. Or we stand in judgment of people. Rather than just accepting that people come from all walks of life, broken in every which way you can possibly imagine to a church. What would we do as a church if we just accepted and loved people as they came to us? How fantastic would that be? That would be the real church, right? That's why we keep hearing about pastors. This pastor gets caught with this infidelity or that infidelity. Just be real. This parishioner, oh, he, he can't be on council anymore. Look what he did. Just be real. We are who we are. We make mistakes. I'm not justifying those things. But we just live pent up because we're so afraid to admit each other. I'm a wounded, broken person. I am what I am. I don't relish in that. I don't glorify in that. But I understand that God loves me and is working God's change in my life. And I'm hoping you can accept that too. Because I accept you as you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word from Paul. These, this is, shouldn't be such a tough message for us. But we just seem to think that our churches need to be about something like other than Jesus. We've conflated our, our, our personal moral codes, our, our political expectations, all of this stuff wrapped into what the church should be, and, and God is just pushing people away. We need to remember the important thing, which is Jesus Christ. And it's about your love. And so we pray that you will continue to touch and transform our lives. Because we come to you as we are. I am what I am, God. And I thank you for accepting me as I am. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.